Well, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, we at CSL White Rock welcome you with a song by our very talented Ranj Singh. Thank you and good morning. It's an original song called Always By My Side, a story about someone who was lost and found their way back. Feeling so confused, I don't know what to do. So I walk these streets alone. There's nothing here for me, and I just can't believe I'm so far away from home. And it seems like only yesterday I was standing there. For your grace and I held my future in my hands Now I look around and cannot seem to find my soul, my identity I look in the mirror, there's a different man I don't know who I am Say that time can heal All the pain we feel That's how the story goes Looked into your home Now I don't feel so alone My spirit starts to grow And I'm sorry if I doubted you I was feeling lost and so confused and basically I was running blind and it took some time to realize you were always there before my eyes you never did ever leave my side you were always by my side And I'm sorry if I doubted you I was feeling lost and so confused And basically I was running blind And it took some time to realize You were always there before my eyes You never did ever leave my side You were always by my side Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Rand. Beautiful. Always by my side. Nice. And I'm so glad that you're here today. So good morning, everyone. I'm Tamara Rossander. I'm a licensed practitioner here with the Centers for Spiritual Living White Rock and also ministerial student. What a joy it is to be here with you on this amazing day. And I'd like to welcome any first time guests that we have, please feel free to let us know where you are um, zooming in from, put it in the chat and we'll have one of our leadership team say hello. And if you have any questions, of course, put that in there as well. So, but as today we gather, I am, want to say that I am a settler here on these lands and I am honored to live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish nations, including Kwantlen, Katsi, Stolo, Semiamnu, Twasen, and Wasonic. We thank the First Nations who continue to live on these lands and care for them along with the waters and all that is above and all that is below. 
So here at CSL White Rock, we are an inclusive spiritual community and learning center. We teach spiritual principles and offer tools to use in all areas of your lives as a regular and consistent basis. When we do so, life flows easier, choices are cleaner, and seemingly miracles are everyday occurrences. There is a wonder in every day just waiting for us to live it. So let's start today. Oh, well, that puts me in a, an emotional place. And I'm so um, fortunate now to be able to introduce my teacher, my mentor, my friend, uh, Reverend Terry Shea. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> I don't know if that's a sign language for anything. <laughs> But Reverend Terry has been uh, an inspiration to me uh, since I started in CSL White Rock back in 2010. And he was our spiritual director for many years and retired back in 2018. So there's some surprising facts about Reverend Terry. At the uh, young age of 13, he voluntarily left his family to attend a junior seminary at the other side of the country. And from there, he moved into becoming a successful teacher. Well, he was a monk for a while. Then he moved into a teacher role at one of our uh, local um, colleges here. And then from there, and he was also a successful rowing coach. And then he took a program and found that his calling was something a little different. And he met um, Marilyn Knipp, his teacher, and uh, decided to follow that path and become a CSL minister. His heart was calling him uh, to do something a little different. So as he, gra and he's as a minister, he has graduated many practitioners, uh, ministers, but he is an amazing teacher and counselor who loves teaching the principle and life affirming concepts of the science of mind. He is highly intuitive, and this is supported by his deep love of the divine. So if you haven't heard Reverend Terry speak before, you're in for a great treat. So now, welcome Rev T in the house. Well, thank you for that, um, that wonderful um, introduction, Tamara, and thank you to all who are participating and contributing to this service. I want to acknowledge, of course, Ranj and that first song, which is a, a wonderful tribute to the hound of heaven that just keeps pursuing us. And also to the hallelujah, which I think fits so beautifully with Diane's choice of the guest house for a meditation. Just a word of introduction that I feel needs to be said. You know, the hallelujah, in, in Hebrew really is praise God. And yet when we read the guest house or hear the guest house and when we you know, hear the lyrics of um, Hallelujah, there appears to be very little in there worth celebrating. People getting their hair cut and being shot and um, all kinds of issues. And yet the human, is able to say praise to you god halle hallel right? it's 11 o'clock and so th that's the part that really kind of gets me about where we are right now in our our journey as a species on this planet i'm i'm in victoria at the present time i'm a block away from the cathedral where i was baptized and as a matter of fact, this is one of the few cities in Canada where you can still hear church bells ring on a Sunday morning. And they're the bells from the cathedral down the street. My parents' home is about five blocks up Pandora Street. And so this is very much that coming home that Ron spoke about. The coming home to a place of awareness of who we are and what we are and what we're doing here. Or perhaps to be more precise, a question, uh, a question about who we are. 
what we're doing here and where we're going. I have to admit that when I settled on speaking, and as a matter of fact, I was told, this is what the theme is, do you want to speak on it? I said to Tamara without a moment's hesitation, yes, I'm going to, question, I'm going to talk about questioning everything. But we live in a time where it seems like that is what everyone is doing, questioning everything. Should we get vaccinated? Shouldn't we? Should we have shutdowns? Shouldn't we? Should, you know, it's the questioning that seems to be so problematic for us right now. Why are we doing the things we're doing? Are they the right things to be doing? Should we be doing something else? All the kind of questions that come up for us in the middle of those crises that we talk about in a kind of a nice way in things like song and poetry. We can sometimes romanticize our struggles when in fact living them often has very little romantic about them. So here's where I want to begin today. Richard Rohr, who is the director and founder of the Center for Contemplation and Action, shared this. When Lady Julian of Norwich looked at a tiny hazelnut, she said, this is everything that is. She looked at a tiny hazelnut and said, this is everything that is. Question that. What was she saying? What was she implying? What is there for me to know in that statement? What is mine to do if I understand that statement, even in my own mind? no matter what she meant. What is mine to do with what I know? Ranj, I, I am so incredibly impressed by your music and by what you bring of soul and heart. And um, that's you saying, this is what is mine to do with what I have. You are the answer to your own question. And we all are. That's the truth of us, is that we are all the answer to our own question. But then again, I'm tempted to ask, who is asking that question? Am I the answer to a great question? A question bigger than I can know. Pascal, the famous French philosopher, said, uncertainty is a very challenging position. Certainty is an absurd one. The great Zen teacher Ronan said, where there is great doubt, there is potential for great knowing. Where there is little doubt, there is small potential for knowing. Where there is no doubt, no learning will take place. So when we say that certainty is an absurd position, what we're saying is that the real value of what we're living through right now, of our struggles, our pains, our concerns, our worries, on whatever level you want to talk about, the real potential for learning is in our very uncertainty. And that's why we have to question everything. There are two ways of asking questions, and we're seeing one way very much today. And this is also one of the reasons I was inspired to do this talk, because 
One way of asking a question is to ask it from certainty. I know what I'm talking about and you don't. And I'm here to convince you that I know what the truth is and that you don't. So I'm gonna ask you a question about what you believe. We talk about setting up straw man or a steel man, something that you can push back against. But is that the best way to ask a question? Already knowing that you know the answer? Why bother asking the question to begin with? How many people get up and pronounce on something and ask about, well, why do you believe what you believe? Only to be able to demolish your belief. The second way of asking question is from genuine curiosity. Time for a personal story. When I was younger, and not very much, well, I'm not much wiser now than I was, but I know a few more things. I had had a series of relationships where the person I was in relationship with always earned less money than I did. And it was troubling. And as a matter of fact, I complained about it a lot to almost everyone who would listen to me except the person I was in relationship with, because that was too dangerous. But I complained to anybody who would listen to me that I'm always in these relationships with people who don't earn money, who are not contributors to our lifestyle. Well, I finally went to a program called Context Training. And I started complaining there the pursuit of excellence, wrong place to complain. Because the first thing someone said to me is, stay curious about that. Stay curious about the fact that you are always in relationships with people who have less money than you. They're all different. You're the common denominator. Stay curious about that. It was that, how shall I say it? It was that saucy remark from someone that has stayed with me through my years, 20 plus years in ministry and the years as an educator leading up to ministry. When I get into trouble, I say to myself, be curious about why you're here, which is another way of asking and questioning everything. We all seek to be certain, but as the great teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, who just passed yesterday at 95 years of age, was fond of saying, it is only to the degree that we are uncertain that we are of any value to anyone. I'll tell you, there's nothing more seductive than sitting in front of a congregation or standing in front of a congregation of religious scientists every Sunday and telling them that you know everything. Except <laughs> there's nothing more humbling than to live your life as a religious science minister and realize in your life, you don't know much at all. Because we make the same issues that everybody else does. Why is that? It's simple. Because we are some version of life's desire to know itself. I am the living embodiment, as are each one of you, of life's desire to express itself. Certainty. I'm doing a funeral on Saturday next week. 
Catholic man, churchgoer, wife a churchgoer, children churchgoers, grandchildren churchgoers, had Huntington's disease for 25 years, experienced a very, very slow decline up until about two years ago, and then his decline became precipitous and he was clearly on his way out. And they, the family documented and shared with me how each one of his faculties was shutting down so that eventually he couldn't even feed himself and he could barely breathe and he was aspirating food into his lungs. And so it was clear the end was near. And he had already made the decision to um, engage in the MAID program, Medically Assistance in Death. And so in the last hours of his life, while a song played that he loved, he made his transition from this world to the next. His, parent, his wife and children, being good churchgoers, went to the parish where they attended and let the priest know what had happened and tried to schedule the funeral and the graveside. But we're told by the pastor that that would not be happening because he had committed suicide and he would not be buried in consecrated ground and the priest would not do the funeral service. I tell you that story because to me, it is a graphic illustration of the danger of certainty. To know that I am right and you are wrong. To know that I can make the right decisions and I need to direct you into making them, otherwise you will be in error. Is a level of not questioning self that becomes unfortunately institutionalized and not only in the Catholic Church, everywhere. Institutionalized certainty is the great scourge of this particular time. Our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, questioned everything from the time he was a little child. As a matter of fact, if you read his biography, his nickname in grade school was the living question mark. He frustrated his teachers and the Congregationalist minister that he was named after. He frustrated his parents. He frustrated Mary Baker Eddy. And God bless him, he probably managed to frustrate people for the rest of his life. He was a man who embraced uncertainty. I read recently someone complaining about how science has flip-flopped on all kinds of things, you know, with, whether masks are good, whether they aren't, whether we should be inoculated, whether we shouldn't, blah, 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 and said, you know, that just proves you science is not the truth. Science has never claimed to be the truth. No scientist on the planet would say that science is the truth. But every scientist will say, that it is looking for the truth. It's not for nothing that Ernest Holmes founded an organization and an institute called the Institute of Religious Science and Philosophy. It's not for nothing that he said, if this teaching works for you, do it, use it. Let it work for you, make it work for you. But if it doesn't, Go and find something that does. Science searches for the truth. It's a theory. Go back to your days in high school chemistry. 
you start with a theory. It's an idea. It's a possibility. It's my question. And I'm going to answer it with an experiment. And the experiment will either prove that I'm right or prove that I'm wrong. And in both cases, I win. When we use this teaching that we have as a way to move us forward into questions, we will be using it at its highest level. When we live, as the guest house poem says, willing to, perhaps not willingly willing to, but at least ready to question everything that comes to us as something that has something to teach, something to give. Then we will live our lives fully. The thing that shocks me about my life at the present time is at 74, almost 75 years of age, I, as a young man, thought I would know everything by now. Now I find the learning curve of my life is steeper than ever because I've moved into a place where now, as I let go of one thing after another, I have to ask, who are you now? Without that, who are you? Without that person, without that place, without that understanding, who are you now? The answers don't always come easily. The answers are challenging. The answers are more challenging than the questions for the simple reason that they lead to more questions. There's a story from the gospels of the faithful servant and I just want to share this story briefly to kind of cap, cap what I've told you. I'll share it in my own words because I'm a storyteller, Raj. The master was going away and he was entrusting everything to his servants. And so he divided up some things and he gave them to him. Ten, ten dollars to this one, five dollars to this one, one dollar to this one. And then off he went. And the servants now were going, well, what am I going to do with this? The one of them said, well, I'm just going to put it in the bank. And even with interest rates as low as they are, I'll at least get something or at least I won't lose it. So the master will be okay. The other one said, well, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take a bit of a risk. I'm going to go into business. And I think I've got some smarts, so I think I can make this happen. And so he did. The third one, who only had one, said, well, if this is all I've got, this is all I've got to lose. And so he buried it. And when the master came back, and he saw what his servants had done. The one who put it in the bank, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. The one who had made money with the five talents, good job, Bill, come on in. The one who had buried it, the master didn't have anything kind to say to him. He said, what have you done with what I gave you? And he said, well, master, I know you're tough. I know that you demand return for your money. So I was afraid. So I took it and I buried it. So what you gave me, here it is. Can you see how that third servant asked nothing of his experience and asked nothing of himself? There was no questioning there. I am afraid. This is all I've got. I'm going to bury it. The object lesson here is this. 
If you can't come up with a decent question about what your life is about and what it is for, then you might as well be buried as you get here. There's no point in living. But if you can ask a few questions, if you can let go of the certainty of burying your talent so that it won't go to waste, if you can let go of the certainty of being safely at home, in a guest house where nobody's going to come and bug you, where nobody's going to come and upset anything, where life is always going to be comfortable. If you can risk uncertainty, if you can embrace the uncertainty, then life will be full. My life has not always been, as we say in England skittles and beer. There have been moments when it was struggle. But I always asked a lot of myself. Sometime I came up roses and sometimes I failed. But I always asked the questions. the good that awaits us, the good that is there for us is in the question. It is not in the answer. Now, I do not know how you proceed from this point, but this is what I like to do and I'm going to ask you to indulge me. I'd like, to, I'd like you to go with me now, open up your heart, if you feel so moved, close your eyes and know this with me. The good that I am seeking is waiting for me on the other side of the question that I am now being asked to address. Who am I? What is my value? What am I doing here? What do I love? How shall I serve? How can I evolve? How can I help my center to evolve? These questions They are yours. They are a gift that life has given to you, along with your DNA. And your life depends on answering those questions. So know with me now that we are, each of us individually and all of us collectively, on the verge of greatness right here and right now, that the invitation to be more, to live more, to have more, to express more, is on the other side of the question. I know for you, outstanding joy, blessing, and success in all you undertake. Because you do not walk alone. That silent, encouraging, and loving presence is always with you. And so it is. Thank you everyone again. And so now is that time of our serve it our Sunday gathering, our celebration, that uh, we ask it for the law of reciprocity, the law of circulation to come into effect so that we can, um, if you're being nourished by our gatherings as well as our weekly and monthly programs, 
just know that gifts of all sizes are welcome and appreciated. And what a lovely demonstration of the law to receive and to give. And knowing that your contribution makes such a positive difference in the world. And you can donate at our website, mail us a check or send us an e-transfer. So I'd like you to join me now in saying our prosperity affirmation. Divine love within blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. <laughs>